Thank you, Yanis. So unfortunately, I don't have any candy to hand out for the last <laughs> presentation of the day. Um, but I do get to talk to you about ISOSeq, which is one of my personal favorite applications with PacBio because RNA is just cool. Um, so to start off with, we're going to talk about what ISOSeq is. I know a lot of you are familiar with the application, but we do have some people um, that are still learning about it. Who is using ISOSeq? What you can now do with one smart cell on the SQL2 system, and where you can learn more information. So what is ISOSeq? So we've had quite a few presentations over the past two days, and a couple of them specifically touching on ISOSeq. And I'm sure many of you in the audience have worked with ISOSeq, um, so this will be a refresher for you. But ISOSeq is PacBio's full-length cDNA sequencing. And since we're sequencing the full-length isoform, so from five prime start to three prime end, we're getting multiple passes at high accuracy, high fi data. There's no assembly required, as noted in my title. You can do this in a targeted or whole transcriptome method. With ISOSeq, you can discover novel genes and isoforms. You can use this in conjunction with your short read RNA-seq data. This is really cool because you can increase the accuracy of your RNA-seq data um, quantification at isoform level resolution. Another big application is doing genome annotation, and you can do this with or without a reference genome. So now you can do ISOSeq in a one-day library prep, which I will go over in the next slide. You can run it on one smart cell on the SQL2 system, and we have full bioinformatics solution for you. So we have our ISOSeq analysis pipeline, which will take the raw data, generate that HiFi data, and output full-length non-concatamer reads. And if you have a reference, you can also map it to the reference with our software. So on to the library prep. Um, it was something we had been asked for for a while to move our ISOSeq prep over to the Express Template 2.0, and that finally came out about two months ago. And I know a lot of you raised your hands when we were asked if um, you had an RS2 or an RS back in the day. Um, so a lot of you are familiar with the older protocol that wasn't quite as straightforward or easy to go through. Um, but the benefits are a massive, and the workflow is very similar to what you are used to. So you'll start with your total RNA. We're going to do the reverse transcription. We have our own template switching oligo with PacBio. Once you have your cDNA, we go in and do the PCR, and this is where you're able to do your multiplexing. So there will now be dual indexed. Um, and then once you have your amplified cDNA, it goes through our standard Express 2.0 workflow. So some of the main improvements, number one, is we drastically reduced the amount of total RNA that you need to go into this prep. So previously, it was on the microgram level. We now recommend going in with 300 nanograms, and we've been successful with down to 60 nanograms. So because all of our Express 2.0 preps are additive only, we see much less handling-induced cDNA damage. Um, the significant workflow, I mentioned multiplexing, so we have 12 validated barcodes that you can go into that PCR step with to multiplex. And the biggest benefit is that there's no size selection required. Um, this actually helps us in having and being able to reduce the amount of total RNA that you need to go into that prep. Um, and you'll see in a later slide that even without the size selection, we're still getting the shorter inserts and we're seeing uh, isoforms out to 15 KB and beyond, which is the one library prep. So what does ISOSeq look like right now on the SQL2 system? This is a Alzheimer brain sample that was run on our 1.0 chemistry. And the things I want to point out is that you can see that there were about 5 million reads, and 85% of those are full-length non-concatamer reads. So that's approximately 4 million reads from one single smart cell. And with this data, you'll get the FASTA file from your ISOSeq output. You can take that into any of your tertiary analysis. I know Anna talked about quite a few yesterday. Um, Squanty2 is one of our favorite ones. Who is using ISOSeq? A lot of people. I'm sure a lot of you have used it. Um, it's one of our biggest applications, and it's highly published. So I want to touch base on two specific recent publications. The first one came from Alex Stanis who was in Ewan Ashley's lab at Stanford. So Alex is really interested in looking at hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, or HCM. So for this experiment, she had a 21-year-old patient female who had severe HCM. 
Genetic testing had already revealed that there was a mutation in the MYBPC3 gene in tronic region, but there was no family data and no existing literature to support this mutation. So what Alex wanted to do is she wanted to go in with a targeted isoseq approach. Um, so she used IDT probes and she sequenced um, control samples and multiple HCM heart samples. So the targeted isoseq data was able to reveal an intronic mutation caused an alternative isoform, which is AS1.1, and the HCM patient to skip exon 20. So she also did targeted genomic DNA. So with the genomic DNA and cDNA pull down, they were able to assign the different MYBPC3 isoforms to alleles. And what they saw was that there was additional aberrant splicing that they were able to, to detect. Um, this is AS1.1 to AS1.11. Um, and the captured DNA was able to reveal that the aberrant splicing was only coming from the mutated allele. So for the conclusion, the one thing I really want to highlight is that PacBio long read isoseq data was the only technology that was able to provide a genetic diagnosis for this patient. And this is really important because this mutant is dominant, so if she decides to have children, she has a 50% chance of passing this mutation on to her children. So that was a targeted approach. Now we'll talk about a whole transcriptome isoseq approach. This is for cancer fusion. So this came from Lee King Tian from St. Jude's. And a little bit of background about this study. So in B cells, only one allele of the immunoglobin heavy chain is active, but in cancers such as B cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia, or BL, IGH translocation is a really common driving event. Um, and IGH ducts for translocation has a distinct profile, and it represents about 7% of pediatric BLs. And this DUX4 region is highly GC-rich, so it's really hard to go in with short reads and analyze that data. So what they did is they took the NOM6BL cell line, which is known to harbor this IGH DUX4 translocation event, and they did whole transcriptome sequencing. This was done on the SQL1 system with two smart cells. They also used a couple different technologies and applications, so they had whole genome sequencing data available, so they had a genome assembled. So they were able to map back this isoseq data to that genome, and they were able to find full-length transcripts of functional IgU, IgH dux for fusion, and antisense dux for. So then they were able to use the SNPs located on the IgH allele, and they were able to show that the IgH dux for translocation that occurs on the silenced IGH allele. So overexpression of DUX4 is really toxic, which explains why the wild type IGH allele was viable, but the IGH DUX4 allele is silenced. Um, so they also saw similar expression in IGH breakage points found in patient samples. So this suggested that this was a very common mechanism. So using long read isoseq data, they were able to detect allelic expression of IGH DUX4, which was not possible with short reads previously because of the highly repetitive content and the short read links. So combining multiple technologies and applications, they did whole genome sequencing, HiC, RNA-seq, and ISO-seq. The authors were able to form a hypothesis of IGH4 DUX4 translocation during the B cell development. All right, so now as an FAS, one of the biggest questions we get is how many smart cells do I need to run to complete my project? And one of the best things about the SQL2 system and the throughput we're seeing with the ADEM smart cells, for RNA-seq, that answer is always going to be one smart cell. So if you're looking to do whole transcriptome sequencing, you're looking to characterize alternative splicing events, the number is gonna be one smart cell. If you're looking to do genome annotation, you can multiplex up to eight different tissues together. So that multiplexing would be done in the PCR of after cDNA generation. So it's one library, one smart cell, and that multiplexing brings it down to about $185 per tissue. I previously showed the Alzheimer brain sample, and as you remembered, we got approximately four million full-length non-concatamer reads from this one SQL2 run. So what we're able to show with a SQL ADM smart cell is that we can saturate known genes and isoforms. 
The rarefaction curve here shows saturation of the known transcripts, but that we can also continually discover non novel transcripts in the Alzheimer brain. And more than 60% of these transcripts are novel isoforms. Back to the size selection discussion. Um, so this was the one library. You can see that we were able to identify transcripts down to 80 base pairs, all the way up to above 14 KB, with the mean read length being just above 3 KB for this library. And Yona showed a really great slide yesterday showing the difference between libraries um, made from our standard kit and with the express kit. And you can see that we're starting to move the average insert side over to the right. We're getting more of those long transcripts coming in through the library prep and into sequencing. And so as one can imagine, this Alzheimer brain sam sample showed complex alternative splicing. We're able to detect the known and novel transcripts. So this is the PLD3 isoform and all of the isoforms have junction supported by Entropolis RNA-seq data. So when you're thinking about your isoseq experiments, if you're doing a human transcriptome, this chart will help you work through the cost a little bit for that. So for sample prep and library prep, you're gonna need our express template prep kits and also we work with the NEB kit to do cDNA generation. Now sequencing on the SQL2 system, we recommend running a 24-hour movie with a two-hour pre-extension, and then going into data analysis on smart analysis using either the IsoSeq pipeline or the IsoSeq pipeline with mapping if you have a reference. Um, and for those of you that don't have an instrument but would like to use our software, we have it available on our website. The license costs nothing, so you're able to play with the data if you would like. Now, if you're looking to do a genome annotation, again, the answer is one smart cell is needed for this project. If you have a good reference genome, you can always go deeper for a better reference gene set. You can also use tools to correct your genome. And if you have multiple tissues, we recommend multiplexing up to eight of those tissues on one single smart cell. We have a best practice guide that continually gets updated if there's a new chemistry, if there's a new protocol. So I'd always recommend going to our website and downloading the best practices guide just to make sure you have the latest information and this will tell you how much inputs, how long it's gonna take, um, how many fully non-concatamer reads we expect to get out of the system. All right, and lastly, where can you learn more? So I'm sure many of you have worked with my colleague Liz. Um, she is one of our ISOSeq experts in-house, and she actually has a really fun blog on Medium. I would highly recommend going to her blog if you want to read her interpretations of papers that come out. She'll always do a blog post for any ISOSeq papers. Um, she'll also talk about any conferences that she's gone to. There's really fun art to go with it. It's just, it's just a fun way to kind of keep in touch with what's going on with PacBio IsoSeq. You can also go to our website. We have everything broken up into applications. So for RNA sequencing, you can see that we have it broken up into human RNA sequencing and RNA sequencing for plant and animals. Once you click on those, everything you could possibly imagine is available for you. The latest protocols will be there, the latest publications will be there, there's training videos on how to analyze your data. Um, honestly, there's so much information available for you there, so I would highly recommend going to our RNA sequencing page if you're interested in doing that. I would also try to keep touch with the smart grant programs that are going on. We have a smart grant page on our website so right now we're doing the neuroscience research. Um, this can support multiple applications. And we have two more SMART grants going on before the end of the year. We have a human biomedical research SMART grant and then a new fun one called Celebrating Advances in SMART Sequencing. So this is also supporting multiple applications and that one will start in November. And lastly, if you would like to play with ISOSeq data yourself, we have released the Universal Human Reference. We ran two smart cells on the SQL2. That data is publicly available, so you can download that and get a feel for it yourself. And if you're interested in that Alzheimer brain sample I was mentioning, um, right now you can go online and download Liz's poster from AGBT this year. And that data release is pending, so hopefully that will be available for you soon as well. And I'm right at 15 minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Great.